I think the pre uh, condition to really thinking through what type of uh, education will best suit 21st century children is first we have to start with a, a kind of terrifying thought, which is there are children at school now who will be at work still in 2065, even maybe 2070. And that's a, that's a scary uh, notion. Um, and the fact that we have little sense of what the world might be like in, let's say, 2030, it, get, it even sharpens that problem. Uh, what's certain, there are very few certainties, what is certain is the challenges they're going to face are probably going to be greater than ours, uh, more immediate, maybe more intractable. Climate change is, I, I genuinely believe, to be irreversible, and it's, it will be for them an issue of coping with it. I suspect that the impact of climate change will, will affect them every single day of their lives, every single day from the year, let's say, 2020 onwards. Uh, so what will that require? Will it require a sort of certain degree of flexibility? It'll require, I think, a great generosity of spirit. It will require a sense, and I'm very, very firm about this, a sense of an understanding of the consequences of every action. Something which, frankly, uh, I would say has been all but missing for the last 30, 40 years. And I'm not really sure that schools have felt the, that they either had the capacity or even the mandate to, to, to teach or address. Now, and I think probably if there's going to be one real difference between young people today, and certainly young people when I was young, and the young people of the future, it would be this sense that every act has a consequence, and whether those consequences are acceptable or not acceptable. They will live in a world, my, I believe they'll live in a world with less freedoms than I've enjoyed, more responsibilities than I've enjoyed, and those responsibilities, those responsibilities will be, as it were, balanced out and traded out for the freedoms that do exist. It'll be tough, and uh, they're going to have to be very resilient, bright, smart, aware, bunch. Are we, do we have the mechanisms in place to create that, that, that society? No, not yet. The greatest systemic problem we have to address is the fact that assessment has, has, has marched along many, many years behind educational development to the point that we, there are a lot of things we could do and should do and actually I think there's a general consensus that we could, could be doing but we don't know how to assess the outcomes of doing it. So the assessment process has got to catch up. That's the first thing. I mean, I would say I've been in education, I've been immersed in the world of education for 12 years now. What I've observed is even when we could honestly claim to have a, let's say, a late 20th century education service, we were still essentially dealing with assessment processes which were forged in the late 19th century and have, have, and have been very rigid. So assessment is number one. The next one is the confidence of teachers. It's very interesting. I, my sense is that the least confident teachers are the ones who actually hide behind bureaucracy. They're the ones that hide behind what they would term conservatism. Let's stick to things that we know, don't stick to our knitting. That is, for me, that's an unconfident teacher. Confident teachers are prepared to experiment and do all sorts of things. The best young teachers I've watched in the last half dozen years have tended to be in primary. And they've tended to be teachers who've got the guts to say to a class, you know what, you know much more about this kit, this interactive whiteboard than I do. Uh, little Johnny, kind of come up here and give me a hand with this. They probably, in most cases, are actually faking it. But what they realise is that getting little Johnny up there to show the rest of the class how to do X, Y, or Z, you get a completely different interaction. Of course, kids expect a teacher to know better than them. But because kids are also very competitive and curious, the idea that little Johnny knows better than them becomes a challenge, a real challenge. So I think peer-to-peer -peer teaching, and indeed mentoring in some cases, is a very, very effective uh, means of communication. And good teachers, good confident teachers, know it and they use it. Bad teachers still want to hide behind the fact of teacher knows best, this is how you do it. Good teachers say, here are a group of tools, here are some options, let me see what you think. Well, the best two little stories come to mind, both of which uh, you may know. One is, uh, was told at a conference about a, a, a kid who was being asked how he felt about technology in the classroom, how he felt about his teacher. And, and he said, you know, the, it was an American kid, he said, you know, it's a real drag. He said, when I walk in the classroom, I have to power down. Now, that's a great line, because it actually is a, there's a deep, deep truth in that. The other is the story, again, has, has had a lot of coverage, of the kid uh, looking at the blackboard and, and the questions being asked you know, for homework. Uh, and a lot of people have got laboriously writing it down, and the, and the boy standing up with his mobile phone and doing that and, and photographing it. 
and what, what happened? His mobile phone's taken away. So this is a kid who understands the mobile phone can photograph the questions on the board and he doesn't have to write them all down. Now, unless you've got a generation of teachers and an, at, and an at, attitude, and if you like, an appetite within education, to see that, that you and I know that's the kid that's going to be smart. He's going to do well in life. But our teachers, so you know, is the teaching profession able to recognise that? So until we're able to get our heads around those issues and get around our heads around all those opportunities, we're going to have a problem. Look, that's my mobile phone. Are there times where I wish I didn't have it? Are there times when I have to sit quietly on a train and switch it off? Are there times where it's an inconvenience? Of course there are. Would I be without it? Absolutely not. Why not? Because I actually couldn't cope with the world life that I live in. Here's my emails coming in on my Blackberry. Are there times where I think I'd like to escape from the emails? Of course there are. On the other hand, there are things I'm able to do, there are acts I'm able to perform, there are engagements I'm able to get involved in, which are only made possible by that. Education's got a simple choice. Do you want to stick your head in the ground and pretend these don't exist and take all the benefits from them not existing? Or do you want to acknowledge they do exist? They're the part and parcel of all the lives of all the young people that are being taught and teach them, as it were, to use them sensibly, well and advantageously. There's no, it, that's a rhetorical question, isn't it? I think, uh, to bring international cooperation into the picture, there are two realities. The first is, what the, the crashing reality of climate change will be that, the, that there's only one planet, there's only one civilization or society, and we will sink and swim together. We may sink or swim at different times. It may well be that Bangladesh, Australia, North Africa get hit harder and faster than the rest of us, but there's going to be no, there's going to be no ultimate winners. We're all going to be losers if we don't address it. So the, the notion of young people thinking they live in separate worlds or separate societies is a, a, a fantasy. And actually, the sooner the world of education uh, kills that fantasy off, the better for all of us. So that's number one. Secondly, uh, there's a kind of magic opportunity here. I mean, I, came, I was a child of the 50s. I came from an era in which you had pen pals and you wrote to people and you absorbed information about their lives through their letters and, of course, at the same time improved your own sometimes your own language was improved. Your own language and indeed their understanding of their language. We don't live in that world anymore and we're very unlikely to go back to it. But the sheer excitement being able to bring through video conferencing other cultures, other attitudes, other lives into the classroom and challenge them and ask them questions and find out more about yourself. I mean, you've got to be deaf, dumb, blind and stupid not to grab at that. And the most important thing is we've got a global community that understands the richness that, that is nece that's necessarily uh, contained in, that, in those experiences and make damn sure we afford them. You know, again, for a, a 21st century school not to have a video conferencing facility will at some point be seen to be bonkers. Uh, at the moment, we're still at the stage where it's a sort of, talking about that, you know. But it's, uh, we'll get past that. One of the frustrating things for me about history, I, I feel this a lot in the House of Lords, sitting in the House of Lords, is things that you know today are actually fundamental. Go back a hundred years and read the debates, which were, they were either regarded as like bizarre or unachievable or, uh, or, or, or weird, you know. Um, the other, we had a debate the other day where I talked about the, the fact that in 1870, as late as 1870, there was a debate in the Lords about whether or not children under the age of 12 should or shouldn't work 12-hour shifts in factories. Who were these lunatics that thought it was a good idea? And what was amazing was the defence for having kids working 12-hour shifts in Manchester factories was that the economy was going down the tubes and we didn't have them. Well, when are we going to kind of wake up and mature as, as, as a civilization and, and get rid of all this nonsense and understand that there is a, you know, that we are in a constant process of evolution and we should be looking at constantly, constantly, constantly improving ourselves as human beings by understanding more about each other understanding more about the actions, the, acts, uh, the, the effects of our actions, and more about the fact that we ultimately, that's a come back to what I started off with, we're going to sink or swim together on this planet, and I know which one I prefer.